Uh, welcome everyone. I'll, I know there's lunch just after this, so I'll try not to hold you too much. Um, but yeah, uh, today I'm going to be talking about how you can sandbox your Linux application. Uh, or if you were on the last talk, how to make the stuff Ole Andre is doing slightly harder and less dangerous. Or you, the same if you were on the binary exploitation talk yesterday. Um, so I'm Martin. I work for Cisco. Uh, if you hate like really crappy pictures, like like uh, oh this is weird, like this one, then sorry that's all you get in this this talk. I bought this drawing board and I found out I can't draw, so I drew all the pictures. So yeah. Uh, before we begin with anything, there's some really important stuff you should know. You should never, ever run the code from these slides. Like, when I make these slides, I have some limitations, like the code needs to fit in the slide. So there are no error checking. Uh, there's horrible code. So please don't use this code directly. Do it properly. Unless you'll, yeah, it probably won't help because you won't get your sandbox and everything seems to still be working, but you're not sandboxed. So the whole point is gone. But first off, we need to figure out, okay, what do I mean by a sandbox? And someone once said that uh, a sandbox is a mechanism to basically isolate and contain an application with the goals of mitigating the impact of vulnerabilities. And I think the mitigation part here is really important because it won't make your code any better. It won't remove any of the issues you have in your code but it will make it harder. So when they get control of your, uh, of your application, they're in a very isolated env environment where they hopefully can do very little. So the person saying this was me. So. <laughs> so yeah, it can be discussed after the talk if you want to. But what, what reasons do you have for sandboxing? So uh, yeah, I talked about trying to make uh, Marit and Ola Andres life a bit harder. Uh, so you have untrusted applications, for instance, that you run uh, in an embedded environment, that's not uncommon. Uh, you get some stuff from a vendor that's pre-compiled, you have no idea what the, what the code actually does. So you might wanna consider sandboxing them and make sure they can't do more than they have to do for your stuff to work. Uh, you can run downloaded code like a web browser. It's a, yeah, it's a scary thing. It goes on the internet, fetches some JavaScript and runs it on your machine. Like this is not a good idea by itself, so you have to like contain it. You might also have an application which has some expectations of your environment that you don't fulfill. So instead of changing your environment, you can give that application a new view of your environment. This is basically what Docker does. It creates a new environment inside of your environment which lets the applications run. So this can be very useful. They're also really fun. Um, I started working on yeah, integrating Qt Web Engine and Chromium on our devices and looking into Chromium and how it does its sandboxing magic was Really fun. Uh, this is not a good idea for actually writing a sandbox, but it's a very good, uh, good reason for actually learning about them and figuring out how they work. So we have a couple of tools. Uh, today we're gonna talk about namespaces and seccomp. We're gonna ignore C groups because we don't have time. Uh, there are other tools as well, like SLinux. Um, probably a lot more that I don't know about. If you make a proper sandbox, you should try and yeah, use the tools you have to their advantage. We're also not gonna use all the features, like all the namespaces, there's a lot of them. We're not gonna use all the features of SecComp. There's still a lot of new stuff to look into after this, but it'll hopefully give you like an overview of, of some of the stuff you have available. 
But this is the start of our, sa our sandbox. Of course, it doesn't sandbox anything, it's just XX a new application. And there are probably nicer ways of doing this, like, like uh, loading your library before you run your code, when then that library sets up the sandbox and stuff like that. But uh, this is a very simple example, very simple setup. And we'll start by using namespaces. So namespaces will wrap some global resource like PID counting or UIDs or yeah, kernel resources. Uh, there are a lot of these namespaces. So we have, for instance, uh, isolation for IP, IPC mechanisms, for network, the view you have of the mount points. We're gonna look into what is called user, PID, mount, and network today, which is four pretty different namespaces. Uh, for a proper sandbox, you should probably look into more of these preferably all of these and see which makes sense in your application. Um, you have two ways of creating a new namespace. You can use either the clone syscall or the unshared syscall. Clone is a beast, so we're gonna focus on unshare because it's simpler. Uh, Basically, clone forks uh, or creates a new process. So fork is implemented using clone and it's, uh, yeah. So uh, they are pretty different. And we'll start with a uh, key one, the UID namespace. So the UID namespace isolates the user in groups that you have available. So basically it creates a new mapping of user IDs and group IDs for you. Uh, the, you, you create it by sending clone new user to, uh, to unshare or to clone. Uh, basically, what happens when you create a root uh, user namespace is that you can mess around with the user. So it can, inside the namespace, it can look like your root, for instance. But you're not really root. You don't actually have all the permissions to mess around with all the files on the system. So with this concept, you can no longer really trust that root is the true root, but you get a lot of new capabilities inside of that namespace. We'll quickly look into how it works. So it's a hierarchical namespace, uh, meaning that you have a, well, a root namespace and then you have child namespaces. And you have these files. These are actually two files. It's the UID mapping and the group ID mapping file. Uh, what this means, let's start on the right side here. Oh, where did my pointer go? Okay. Uh, so this means that UID zero inside of the namespace is UID 1000 outside of it. I didn't do that mapping for a single UID. So for this case, we say that we are, with this mapping, if I'm UID 1000 and group ID 1000, inside of this namespace, I look like I'm root. You can also do crazier bindings, like you can say UID 100 inside of the namespace is 688 outside of it, and you do that for 500 UIDs. And then you will get something like this if my, if my math isn't completely off. Um, this is necessary to be able to enter other namespaces without being actual root. I don't wanna to have to run my application as root to be able to sandbox it. That doesn't make sense. So you do tricks like that, like this. And the way you do it is unshare clone a user. At this point, you created and entered a new user namespace. Uh, for most of these, Unshare will both create and move your application into the namespace. There's one exception that will come to. But at this point, your user is effectively nobody. You don't have a mapping. So you have very little things you can do. So you have to actually create the mapping. Uh, so what you do 
is you write to these magic files, proc self UID map and proc self GID map. And I fetched the user and group ID I was before I entered the namespace so that I can use them in the mapping. So basically I set UID zero inside of the namespace to be whatever I was outside of the namespace. So if I was 1000 when I started the application, I get 0001. There is a problem here which is why I should never use this code because I don't check error. So this write fails. I'm not allowed to write to this file. I have to write to another file first. I have to write to this set groups file. I have to write deny to set groups. And that's to avoid giving me permissions to add new groups as I go. So it basically locks me down to whatever I set up. If I were properly checking error messages, this would have failed and I would see it, but I don't. Uh, after doing this, inside the namespace, it looks like I'm root. And inside the namespace, I have all capabilities. So now I'm set up, set up to enter new namespaces. And so the first one I want to look into is the mount namespace. And you enter that or create that by using clone new NS. Some of you might think this is a weird name, like the other one was clone new user, which makes sense, you clone a new user namespace. This is clone new namespace. Uh, this is, well, this is the first namespace. And as always, no one thought there would ever be a second one, so they used up the name. Uh, this one creates a new list of mount points. It, it changes your view of the mount points on your system. So basically you can rewrite how your file system looks and that's what we're gonna do. Uh, it's a interesting thing because you, you have a couple of modes. You can be completely isolated, like you create a new namespace and you change stuff and no one else sees it and vice versa. You can also have them share their view, like they're different namespaces, but they can share their view. Or you can have your uh, namespace follow the original namespace and changes done in the original is visible to you, and but your changes aren't visible the other way. So for our purpose, we don't care about anything except for isolation. So we're gonna remove ourselves from that link Previously, that was the default. Previously, you didn't really have to do anything with this. The default was not to share, but then system D came in and they changed the default. So if you don't wanna care about what init system you're running or what the default is for your system, you can just set everything to unshare. That's the safest. So you create it by just adding clone UNS to your unshare. Uh, this makes a copy of your previous namespace. So it looks exactly the same, like there's no visible difference now. And the next thing you do is this thing. You set the, the root of your file system tree to private and you do that recursively. So after doing this, you can mess around as much as you want to with your file system and no one will see it. And other people can mess around with their file system view and you won't see it. Of course, if you have shared mount points, this is not, yeah, so you're, you're mounting stuff into it. So if someone changes something inside of that mount, then you see, of course, new, new files and stuff like that. But they won't mess around with your mount points. And after doing this, we can create ourselves a new rootfs, and that's what I'm gonna do. So I wanna find a folder that I know exists that I don't need anything from. For me, um, often that could be temp, so I just remount temp with a tempfs. So no one else has that tempfs. That tempfs is unique for me. And then I can build from that. <clears throat> 
So I create some directories like templib64 and yeah, templib probably a couple of others as well. Uh, basically stuff my application needs. So since I'm executing, I need to be able to load libraries that this application needs. You could be smarter and actually inspect what libraries it needs and only mount those libraries. That's safer, but it's more work, so I don't do it. Uh, and then I bind mount lib64 to my new folder. That means I now have the original slash lib64 also in temp lib64. Because I'm going to remove myself from the original root. And of course, I need my application. Uh, so I take my application and I, I create a file that I just call application. I don't care about the name at this point. And I buy, buy and mount my first argument, which I know is the application, to this file. And then I should be able to execute that. So after doing this, I've set up a new root file system where I'm not yet. So I gotta enter it. Uh, the way I do this is by using this pivot root. Pivot root is not exposed in glibc, uh, but what it does is it takes the first argument, that's your new root folder. That's your new root mount point. And then it puts the old root mount point to the second argument. So you still have access to your old root mount, root uh, mount point. You could CH root, but that has some limitations. For instance, it would limit your application from go enter a new user namespace. Uh, so pivot root is preferable because then you can do whatever you, then the application can do whatever it wants. So after creating my new, my new root, I CD to my root, and then I unmount my old root file system, because I don't want to have access to that. Uh, but of course, it's still in use. I have to do it detached. But after doing that, I can remove the, the folder. And I'm good. Now I'm removed from, from the original file system. I'm now, my file system view is now whatever I created in temp, which is nice, because then I can run that application. So. Every other file on the file system that I that this application has no business touching, it can't touch because it doesn't exist. The next step I want to do is get rid of all the other processes. Like I'm not going to kill them because I can't, uh, but I want to make sure that I don't know of processes I don't need to know. And I said that unshare for most times creates and moves you into a new namespace. For the PID namespace, it doesn't. The kernel developers found out that a process on the fly changing their PID is probably a bad idea. Uh, so they didn't. If you use clone, you of course create a new child and that child is put into the PID namespace. But for unsure, that doesn't happen. Uh, so the rules are, when you create a PID namespace, you create the namespace, but it's empty. And then children you create are put into the namespace. And the first child will get PID1. Uh, PID1 in Linux is special. PID1 is the init system. And the init system has some responsibilities, like cleaning up orphan children, or killing orphan children if you want to, if you really want to use the good lingo from uh, Linux. Um, and that's important, because that also is true inside of the namespace. So if you have several processes inside of the namespace, and one of them becomes orphan, then your PID1 needs to clean that up. So, for instance, for Docker, there's a recommendation to only have a single process inside of your one Docker container. And this is the reason, because that process is PID1. And if you have more, you risk having orphan processes, which that application needs to clean up. 
So you can have more processes, but your first process should then be an init process, or at least behave as an init process. And this is kind of how it looks. So you have like the original namespace, which has lots and lots of processes. Um, it has its own init process, of course, systemd or whatever you're using. Uh, you create a new namespace and put a process in it. This process will be PID1, uh, but in the original namespace, it will have some other PID. So from the parent namespace, you can see every other process, but they will have a different PID than what they think they have themselves. Uh, yeah, and you can have big layers of this. And every parent namespace will have a different PID than what you think you are, basically. Um, yeah. So to, to create it, it's as simple as all the other ones. You just add clone new PID. But this has only created a namespace on the side issue. There's nothing in it. It's right now pretty useless. So you have to create a child process to enter it. So the way you could do that is by forking and let the child do all the like swapping of routing roots and execing and then have the parent process just wait for the child to die. So this part of the code is outside of the namespace. It's in the original PID namespace. And then the rest of the code or the child will be PID1. At this point, you can do some more fun stuff uh, with the mount namespace, actually. You couldn't mount a new proc. Well, if you, if you were able to, you would see all the processes from the original namespace if you mounted proc previously. You could bind mount the old proc, but of course, that only gives you, that leaks information that your namespace shouldn't have. But at this point, you can create a new proper procfs. Uh, in your slash proc if you want to, and it kind of looks and feels like a proper, like a proper file system. Uh, in this proc, at this point, there will only be a single application. It will be your application and nothing else. And lastly, we'll talk about the network namespace. It is, well, it's a kind of weird namespace. Uh, what it does, it creates a new networking stack for you on the side, or you get your own network stack in the namespace. Uh, you create it with the clone new net. And when you create it, you have no network interfaces. Well, you have a loopback device. Uh, that's all you have. And there exists nothing else. It's kind of useless by itself. If you, if you want to remove yourself from the network, it's super efficient. You just remove yourself from the network. You can put, uh, put interfaces in it. You can take an uh, interface from one network namespace and put it into another. It is then moved. You can also like, create, uh, create virtual network devices to tunnel data between network namespaces and then use IP tables, for instance, to filter out traffic and route it as you want to. It's a lot of work to get right. Uh, if you move a virtual network device into your namespace, when your last process exits the namespace, the namespace is destroyed and the virtual network devices are also destroyed. If you put a physical interface into it, the physical in interface is moved out into, your, into the original network namespace of the system. So it can, it can look like something like this. This is the original network namespace that's created when you boot up. Uh, you create a couple of new network namespaces. Most of them are empty. They only have the loopback device. 
But with this one, you created a, a virtual Ethernet pair so that you can move traffic between the two uh, namespaces. And then you would typically, in this namespace, have some IP tables rules to well, filter the traffic and yeah, do whatever you need to do to give it the network access that it needs, but nothing else. Because you still might need network access, you just want to limit it really, really much. So this is one way you could do this. You could also hook it up to a bridge, uh, bridge network device on your on this side to get access. That's what Docker does. When I've used it, I've basically just entered a network namespace and removed network. Because uh, this thing is, yeah, it's a lot of work to, to get this right. Um, so yeah, this is how we enter it. Um, the reason I do it in the child is so that in this case, the parent could potentially like start setting up network devices if it needed to. Um, it looks very simple when you do this because you're only removing network, but if you want to do more fancy stuff, it starts getting tricky and I'm not going to show that because, yeah. Uh, so this basically removes your network devices. You can set up network yourself. For namespaces, there's been a whirlwind tour, uh, and there are lots more. Uh, these are some other that I think is very interesting to look into, um, especially the IPC one, actually, because if, you if you're using IPC, you m or if you have an application that uses IPC or Linux kernel IPC mechanisms, you probably want to isolate that somehow. So if you're making a proper sandbox, you should definitely look into this. Okay. The next, yeah. The UTS gives you a host and domain name separation. So you can have different host names and domain names inside of your UTS namespace. Uh, for SECOMP, that's a mechanism to filter system calls. So if you use SECOMP, you get filtering all, all system calls and it allows exit, sig return, read, and write. So this is pretty useless. Like most applications use way more system calls than that. You can also say it doesn't have open and close. You need to like feed it file descriptors. Uh, so this is the original SecComp. Luckily we evolved and started using SecComp BPF. So SecComp BPF uses the BPF framework in the kernel, uh, Ber Berkeley packet filtering, which is a language. It's a programming language. You can, it has a, it has a VM, it has a JIT compilation if you, compile that into your kernel. It's uh, it's used for a lot of stif stuff, among others. Uh, among others, uh, TCP dump uses it quite heavily to, to filter out and only get the system calls or the, the packets it needs instead of moving every packet from kernel space to user space, which is expensive. But it's an in-kernel programming language. Uh, and with this, I can make my own filters and allow exactly the system calls I want. I can even make sure that the arguments are what I expect. So this starts to become a lot more powerful. And there's a couple of ways of writing these filters. And we can start with this one. So this is the what the kernel provides you. If you want to write it this way, you can. I wouldn't recommend it, but I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, basically, SECOMP will operate on this structure. So you have the system call number, the architecture you're running on, the instruction pointer from where the system call was called, and the arguments to the system call, up to six. 
the instruction pointer I've never used, but it's pretty cool that you can actually limit who are able, who are allowed to call the system calls. The architecture is pretty important. So the language is the same independent of architecture. The binary will be the same. But the problem is that on two different architecture, let's say x86 and ARM, or x86 and x86, 664 if you want to, the system call numbers are different. And you're checking system call numbers. So if you're loading something written for 64, x86-64 on x86, it will allow something. Don't really know what. Um, this is like the setup for starting using the raw sack comp. Uh, basically, you have a filter, sock filter, where your code lives. You have this sock fprog struct, uh, and you send that into syscomp, setting it to filter in this case. You can do other stuff like set mode log, for instance, if you just want to log the violations. Uh, and you have to set no new privs so that you can't load new second filters that gives you more access, because that would be bad. Uh, after doing this, you have a second filter running. This one is basically just allowing everything, which is plain stupid, because it's what it does by default. But we'll, we'll work this one out. So, I want to check the architecture. It is important to make sure that you're actually running on the right architecture. So I check what architecture I'm running on. I expect to be x86-64. So I load from this struct, from this struct second data, the architecture. So it's just an offset into the structure I get. I load that number into a register, and then I check. I do a jump, if equal, uh, whatever is in the register is x86-64. So if it is, I jump zero. So I just go to the next line, which is allow. And if it isn't, I jump over this allow statement and come to kill. Uh, this is not a full check of the x86-64 architecture. Do not write it this way. You also have to check for x32 syscall bit because it has different syscall numbers. It's, uh, yeah. Oh, did I, yeah. It's, you, you're gonna find out that this is hard to work with. Um, now I've checked architecture, I wanna actually start checking system calls. So, after checking the architecture, I have to load back the, or load in the system call number. So I do, basically the same BPF load with the system call number instead of the architecture. And then I check if this number is equal to sysexecve. We know I execve, that's the first thing I do after this. Uh, so if it is, I jump zero and go to allow, and if not, I jump one and go to kill. So this is how you check a system call. Now, for at one point of this talk, the, the demo application I made, this was the full BPF statement. It has grown because I update, uh, I update glibc and suddenly glibc uses new system calls. This has to be kept up to date. And the ordering here matters. Not for correctness, but say I have a program that xx, uh, let's see, let's, where is xx? Uh, uh, there is xx, it's pretty far down. Uh, and it xx once, but it like writes a lot of files. It opens one file one time, and then it writes a lot to it. You want the right system call to be as fast as possible. This is evaluated statement by statement. So if your write is at the bottom, then it will have evaluated everything before that, and then it checks if you can write. So you want write to be at the top of this list. If you want to rearrange this, that's gonna be fun. If I go here and like add something under MunMap, 
then every jump above whatever I put in has to be updated. If not, they'll jump wrong. They'll jump one to, well, one short, and everyone will start checking SysBRK, and they're not. This is painful. So, yeah. You can also check arguments. You load in, basically, if, if I want to check the argument for exit group, uh, instead of jumping over everything to allow, I say, okay, if it's exit group, I just continue, because then I have to load in the first argument into the register, and then I check if that argument is zero. If it is, I jump to what I hope is allow and what I hope is kill. But like we found out, th this, don't write this. It's, it's, you're gonna be so sad. It is horrible. So instead, you should use something else, like libseccomp. Uh, there are other ways. Uh, the Chromium people made uh, their own their own version of, of this, which is feels more programmatic. I haven't actually tried using it, but uh, it's a lot easier to read. Um, but at least for a smaller seccomp program, if you're not making a browser and use lots of syscalls that you need to check arguments on, then probably libseccomp is good enough. So what we do here is we create a second filter and we give it a default action. And the default action is if, if nothing else happens, if you don't hit any, anything that says allow, for instance, do this. So if nothing else, kill the process. Then we load it into the kernel and then we release the user space part of that because that's not needed anymore, it's in the kernel. This looks like it does only does killing, but the cool thing with libseccomp is this one does the architecture check for you. I don't have to write architecture check. I can if I want to. I can swap what architecture I'm interested in, but I don't have to. So to add a new rule, like we did with like with all the jumps and stuff with uh, the raw seccomp. I put in the, the context a new rule where I say allow this rule. So I allow the system called execv and I have zero argument check. Uh, the important part here is that you should use the SEMP underscore sys thing because that makes sh make sure that you get the correct, uh, the cor correct syscall number depending on your argument or your architecture, sorry. This feels a lot nicer. You're just adding a new rule, allow this to scroll, and then let libseccomp take care of it. So compared to whatever I had with the raw seccomp usage, this is the equivalent for libseccomp when I basically wrap it into a function call because it was too long for my slides. Um, if I want to rearrange stuff or put stuff over other stuff in this, I can just do it and libseccomp will handle it for me. You can also, after this, say that, oh, I want to prioritize write. libseccomp has APIs that let you just set up what filters you want and then you can do a prioritization in a different part of the code if that makes everything clearer. And if I wanna check arguments, that's also a lot nicer. Uh, at the end of my second rule, I just say, okay, I have a I have an argument check. I want to check, I have, want to have one check for arguments. What I do is I do this SEMP A0. That means the first argument, argument zero. You also have A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, which is the argument one to six. I want to compare if it's equal to zero. And that's your argument check. You can also expand this because when I say it's one argument check, it's because it's one check for arguments. You can add more checks for the same argument. So you can, for instance, check if a value is like between something, 
that's pretty useful to check if it's uh, if you're in a range. If you're outside of the range, you kill the program, and if not, then you discontinue it. So with libsecon, this gets a whole lot nicer to work with. Uh, you won't mess up the jumps, which you will do at some point if you try and do the raw secom thing. Um, but yeah, there are other ways of doing it that you could look into. Um, especially the 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 chromium uh, the chromium apis looks pretty decent i haven't tried it but i've looked into it um yeah there are also other tools that you should use like i said you should look into c groups you should look into s linux uh for instance the android uh, the android uh, sandbox is are based on as a Linux. Uh, you can use C groups if you want to make sure that your application doesn't like use all of your CPU time or all of your memory and stuff like that. N none of what we're going through today covers those parts. That's a job for C groups. And uh, that's all I had. So thank you. Any questions?